Diese Konferenz wird nun aufgezeichnet. We, um, as most of us know, uh, TU Vision, or let's say Vision of the Technik University in Vienna, was established a little bit more than five years ago um, on the occasion of our 200th anniversary. Um, the 200th anniversary was in 2015. And uh, this anniversary motivated a group of people, including myself, uh, to think not only about the glorious past or not so glorious past, Uh, but uh, also about the hopefully glorious future. And therefore, we were asking ourselves, how can uh, the future of a Technic University look like? And particularly, what is a Technic University actually good for? And, uh, and uh, what is its, its, its role in society? And, and, uh, but also far beyond this, its role in science, its role in engineering, its role in philosophy, and so on and so forth. And um, we have had a couple of, of very interesting events. You will see this on our website. On the one hand side, we looked into ourselves. We had, we had workshops and discussing, trying to found, find out who we are, uh, what are the different cultures in our house, uh, what do we share, what do we not share, where do we live from our commonalities, where do we live from our differences. And on the other hand, it was very interesting and very, very important for us to have a very global vision and to invite everybody who is uh, interested and, and famous and whatever, young or old, female or male or whatever, to discuss with us what is a technical university uh, about. And, uh, and um, today, uh, now that we have um, this, this, this online format, and this is what, what my co-moderator Simon will, will go more into detail, uh, again, we are looking in this very global version, a little bit like our very first uh, event, Uh, we want to look uh, onto this uh, onto this globalized world where everyone is now sitting in his own room, more or less, depending on the the amount of active cases. In Austria, we have so few that the people they start to to forget that there was anything, uh, and to and to remind ourselves, you know, how we are all sitting in our small village, and and thinking about uh, humanity, science, and engineering. Uh, so that's a little bit the idea about this vision 2025, then it was 2025 plus, so let's say for, for the next, um, we should now call it perhaps 35 plus or whatever, for the next decades of, of what is going on. What we did not at all imagine in 2015 is that we would have a pandemic uh, a few years later and that we would do it in the way we do right now. And, and talking about the pandemic, I would like to, to now give to my co-moderator to, to say a few words, uh, first on the administration of our meeting and then to, to start getting into gears. Simon, please, uh, um, it's your part to give your introduction, so to speak. Switch on my microphone. Thank you, Christian, for the introduction. Uh, apologies for the noise in the background. This is um, the current working conditions. Uh, I hope it's uh, it's uh, less loud, less noisy in a second. That leads me to some technical issues. First of all, I hope you can all hear Christian and me. You will see on your screen if you are on, on Google to Meeting. You will see on the top right you will see how many people there are at the moment there are 42 people and there are more people coming in and next to this there is a bubble and this is our chat function leah has opened the chat function with a welcome note and um, in order to see if you can work with us this is this is where you can give us feedback where you can can ask questions to uh, to what you hear or to the moderators and Could I ask you, please, uh, that some of you um, tell me via the chat function if you can hear and see me well, if all is fine. Then if so, please let us uh, give us a brief yes. Ah, fantastic. Okay. So Christian, my co-moderator, says yes. So when you can hear me, that's all fine. That's great. Um, uh, a second thing is that Lea uh, mentioned the first uh, in, um, uh, um, issue in the chat function. That we will um, um, that we will record this uh, in the recording. As far as I know, there you can only see those people who have switched on their their video. So we ask all of those who are not going to give a statement, which is the people who are visible now, that um, uh, that you switch off your microphone and that you switch off your camera. That looks on my screen. It looks uh, it looks fine. Um, so
somebody says uh, you can't hear anything i apologize but for others it seems fine so for, um at some next to the bubble on the top to the right there's something that is called in german einstellung i don't know the english term at the moment uh, but here you can check your audio functions um settings yeah i hope it's uh, uh, settings yeah sorry <laughs> so uh maybe you'll find uh, a response there um so much for the technical uh things so we all get we all try to to become digital experts and i actually didn't know what go to meeting is uh three months ago and uh i'm a professor of uh, sociology here at tu vienna and uh, usually known for being a bit analog in my uh work environment but i try to get uh, to speed up with the uh, uh my digital skills um and that is that is due to the due to the pandemic due to the covid 19 situation and it's one of the things i'm actually happy about that i can that i can learn these things but there are other things i have a bit more ambivalences about and i think the same would uh, might apply to many of you and uh, that is actually what uh, we want to discuss Today, as Christian mentioned, uh, the, the the group that is uh, gathering and inviting you for a discussion is a group that cares about the future of TU Vienna and uh, about our way of uh, working individually and collectively and research and uh, teaching and other issues um, together at a public uh, university. We also talk about our responsibility as researchers at a public university in in this group. And, uh, all of this, of course, has a certain, there, there's a clear link to the COVID-19 situation. And we, we decided uh, that today we want to look at what happened to research um, and uh, scientific life in the last few months after the pandemic. And we wanted to look at this at a global, through a global perspective and through a uh, multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary perspective. So we want to really to look at the everyday of a scientific institution. And uh, for, for that reason, we have invited four dis distinguished guests who have accepted uh, to speak to us and we'll introduce them in a minute. But I can personally say that I'm incredibly excited about the next hour and that I'm very happy that you have accepted the invitation because I guess I think we have a really great range of uh, perspectives to listen to. And uh, with, the, with those four, four guests, we'll discuss about two things. We'll discuss um, about how COVID-19 and the pandemic relates to our work, be it my, to my work as a sociologist, be it to the work of an environmental uh, engineer, be it to the work of, a, um, of uh, uh, people working in mathematics, people working in science. How, how does it, re has it related? Has it, does, which relation um, does the COVID-19 uh, pandemic have in terms of content to your work, to our work, in terms of research? and in terms of teaching. And the same question also applies to the organizational consequences, because uh, consequences. We lived through the pandemic and we lived through a lockdown, which is now slowly, at least in Austria, I had access to my office today. Uh, today. Uh, today it was the first time that I didn't have to sign in my name. So things are changing. But how did we cope with the organizational changes over the last months? And that is the second part of uh, what we want to discuss. How do we prepare for the next uh, for the next months in uncertainty? There's a term that many people use these days, which is the new normal, but it always comes with a question mark. What will be the new normal? So we also ask our colleagues to look, to think about the, their research, the, the content of your work in the future. Will it have any relation? Will it have changed due to, to the pandemic and organizational issues around your research? and around teaching, how will they change, or how will they have changed, and uh, will they change back to a normal, or will it continue um, in a digitalized, different, uh, distant way as you had it over the last months? What do you expect, what will come up? Uh, context. As moderator, I, I take the liberty and power to switch off your microphones, which I just have done. So, uh, um, um, yeah. So to, to sum up, what we want to discuss with our guests is how has the COVID-19 um, uh, pandemic affected your 
uh, your research and your teaching in terms of content and in terms of organizational challenges and issues. And what will be the new normal? How, to, how do you prepare for the next month? We'll ask these questions to four, four guests. And I switch now to Christian to introduce our first guest. Okay, thank you much. Our, our first guest is uh, Dr. Christina Balania. Um, we do it alphabetically. So <laughs> I, I know uh, uh, Christina because of a European-wide network I'm part of. Um, so um, by training, I'm civil engineer, engineering mechanician, but with a very broad focus. So starting from, from concrete and, and wood and so on, but then going far also into biomedical engineering. This is why I know actually Christina um, she is assistant professor, or assistant researcher, dependent on how you how you translate it in material <laughs> science yeah. at the Polytechnic of Torino. Uh, she she focused a lot on antimicrobial nanostructured coatings for several applications, and not only in biomedicine but also in aerospace or, or in civil engineering. And um, she is also working at the at the at the crossroads between uh, university life and 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 private companies. And uh, with this, uh, she has, has also uh, done a lot of patents and so on. She's, and and uh, and uh, you know, is very active also at the at the at the, um, transforming practice, engineering practice uh, from the from the university level. Yeah. Then I give back to to Simon for the second guest. That's Emil. So we do the ping pong. So the second guest, uh, the, the, the second speaker will, Massimo, will be Massimo Piccoli. Massimo is a professor of planning and urban policy and the head of the architecture and urban studies department of Politecnico di Milano. So we have two guests from Italy today who have experienced a very dramatic situation over the last, the last months. And um, as that, Massimo is a professor of urban planning. So he's been asked many times over the last weeks, what will be the post pandemic city? And I've been, and I've seen seen pictures of him uh, in in, uh, in empty cities, cities during the lockdown. So um, I assume Massimo that you will share with us some of your ideas about how um, how the pandemic has affected cities and planning. But I also know Massimo not not only through his work on urban planning, but also in, in on housing. And uh, we all know that that uh, there's been. Um, very, very high uh, constraints and challenges to housing uh, condition, uh, to people living in severe housing conditions and problematic housing conditions. So there's a few relations of what happened over the last months to your to, to your work, and we're very happy to have you here, Christian. Okay. Then, then coming back, uh, Professor Gilmore, Stuart Gilmore is a, a typical acquaintance of mine because of the pandemic. I would have never come into contact with him without the pandemic. So, so when everything started, my, my personal approach to it was to do a little bit of science about it, in, in, to have the hope to understand at least a little bit. And, and with this, uh, with colleagues, uh, we started to check these this population kinetics models and so on, which we use also in mechanobiology and, and biomechanics normally. And then I, I came around, across his name because he was one of the few preprints who said, you know, we have to be careful with the equations itself, themselves. It's not so it's not so clear what you find out. It depends very much what you put in as data. And this 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 I like very much and therefore I came into contact with him. Stuart is a professor of biostatistics and bioinformatics at St. Luke's International University in Japan, in Tokyo, Japan. Uh, he's Australian and uh, he did his undergraduate degree in mathematical physics and higher education in public health and statistics. But he has been living in Japan since 2006 and has been working uh, mainly on, on, uh, on HIV viruses and so on and, 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 uh, and, and public health issues. And as I understood from from his uh, from his more recent uh, uh, publications, uh, uh, then COVID-19 uh, uh, kicked in, and he also became part of this story. And with this, I go back to Simon, and then we can really start finally. Yes. Yes. Uh, sorry for all these long introductions uh, by, by by the moderators. But the the fourth guest, and uh, we're also very happy to have you here. Heidi is Heidi Mani Shah. Uh, Heidi is a senior lecturer, lecturer at the Research Unit for Water Quality Management at the Institute of Water Quality and Resource Management here at TU Wien. 
In her research, she deals with emerging pollutants in the urban water cycle with a focus on advanced wastewater treatment technologies um, to, uh, to the elimination. In the last few years, Heidi has been coordinating the establishment of a new environmental engineering curriculum here at UOB, um, and the bachelor program just started last year. And Heidi is also part of the TU Vision 2025 Plus group, so one of the people who are uh, who care about our working uh, life, uh, everyday life here in this uh, organization. Great to have you all here. And uh, we'll kick, up, kick off all, um, uh, alphabetically with Christina. Christina, the floor is yours. Okay, I can start, <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you for uh, inviting me to attend uh, this uh, discussion. Uh, where I can start, uh, I can talk about my um, the affection of the COVID uh, on my research activity. Uh, as uh, a lot of uh, um, countries, uh, we in Italy we have a complete lockdown, and so my university completely closed. Um, only some uh, office, very important office, administrative office, uh, remain open, but uh, laboratory were uh, closed. And my research activity concern for the 60-70% of my time in laboratory because I have to test material to produce some material to realize my, uh, my research activity. And so we have to completely stop this uh, fundamental part of my, uh, of my activity and uh, um, on the contrary, I can. Uh, I was able to work a lot uh, at home remotely, and uh, I was able to write uh, a lot of uh, proposals because in this period also a lot of uh, I have the uh, possibility to work in a, in an activity uh, directly um, involved in the COVID uh, pandemic because uh, I work uh, on uh, antimicrobial and uh, anti uh, antiviral coatings. And uh, this uh, is uh, directly involved in the in the COVID. Um, it has a, a relationship with uh, COVID, and so uh, we. Ha I am able. I was able to write a lot of uh, proposal because uh, uh, both at the national and the European level, uh, a lot of grants uh, will be uh, were were funds uh, for uh, for. Uh, for this period, for this uh, hot uh, topic, uh, has uh, the uh, to contribute to contribute to tackling the, the COVID nineteen. So uh, we uh, open as university uh, our laboratory uh, at the beginning of May, but uh, very few people can uh, enter in the laboratory. Uh, we have a fixed number of people. Uh, uh, that uh, have the access uh, to the Politecnico, and uh, but we, as soon as uh, we are able to start uh, to begin again uh, with our activity, uh, we have to, the possibility to prepare uh, some of our uh, some of our uh, samples uh, to be tested against uh, COVID. So uh, we have uh, stop our activity for two months more or less, completely stop, but uh, we continue also with uh, uh, the contact with uh, companies, with uh, other research centers, and uh, we were able to, to have uh, finally some uh, important results about, uh, about our antiviral uh, coatings. Uh, it was not uh, easy uh, to have this, uh, to, to do our work in uh, at home. Also because uh, I have a, a very uh, small daughter, she, ha she is uh, only four years old and she is at home, she was at home with me. And so it, it is not easy to uh, combine uh, the, the, the work with the, uh, the family, with uh, a, normal, uh, a normal life. It is very difficult. Um, on the contrary, um, also the teaching was, um, was uh, done uh, with uh, a platform uh, Polito Politecnico di Torino was able to perform to help uh, professor to 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 uh, 
to to give the the the, the, the lessons to to the student in a very good way so uh, the 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 lessons uh, go on also during uh, this uh, uh, pandemic it, it is not the same as uh, to be in a classroom because you are not able to see uh, the students you are not able uh, to see if the students uh, follow you when uh, you you discuss about your lesson when you give the, the uh, also in, during the exer exercitation the exercise uh, lesson but uh, we try to go on <laughs> in uh, some way during uh, this uh, this strange uh, this strange period and uh, in italy the lockdown uh, is about uh, the completely lockdown is about uh, two months more or less so it is not uh, <laughs> it's not so easy. <laughs> okay. Uh, if you okay. have any questions, okay. No, I don't know if you <laughs> if you need some other questions. questions uh, coming up. Um, at least I have noted at least four questions that I would pose to you, but I keep them for later. And okay. uh, thanks for for the, uh, the first statement. And I move to to Massimo and ask you about how have you coped with the last months and how do you look forward to the next half year? Okay, thank you for the invitation. Uh, really glad to have a chance to discuss with you. Uh, as uh, my colleague uh, just said, uh, of course, Northern Italy was very much affected in the past uh, months because the lockdown was very uh, long and intense and uh, I would say as a uh, from the point of I'm, I'm a professor in urban planning but also since uh, the first of January I became the head of the department and it's a very large department architecture and urban studies so this was also a very special time for me because I was very much dealing with management issues in the university and and this also allowed me to be very close to the to the rectorate and to yes to the other 11 directors of departments which have responsibility on on the academic stuff and also on the administrative stuff uh, so i would say that from the perspective of urban planning uh, many are the discussions we are having with uh, colleagues but also dealing with the city administrations who are in need of uh, support and are consulting us to understand how they could uh, provide uh, good solutions for the next months. And my, my, from my perspective, what is really interesting is that after decades in which we have been saying that urban planning uh, concerns not, an, not any, any longer growth, but urban change, so it's not uh, an issue of planning new urban developments, but of transforming the existing ones. I think that the pandemic really made this very clear because in this short time, uh, our lives changed a lot while the spaces are the same. So there was no physical change, uh, but a reorganization of space. And I think this is really interesting and it's very much at the crossroads between planning so dealing really with space design and organization it's dealing with uh, of course also medicine because there are issues which concern the pandemic but it's dealing with management it's dealing with social sciences uh, exactly because there is no time for it's not an issue of redesigning space but of managing a different use of it and this is really challenging at all scales from the fact that it's, uh, it became very clear how people living in a very small uh, flat who in a city like Milano, which is very expensive, of course, this was acceptable and very fine for many to have a very small flat in the city, a studio, uh, but then to, to live and work and having no chance to enjoy open space, uh, it's really like, it's a trap. So the whole issue of housing is very much affected. And, uh, and it shows uh, how much planning should deal uh, at the same time with places and people together. And this is not obvious. Also in a technical university where you have many colleagues who are architects and uh, still have very much uh, you know, the tendency to think of uh, 
uh, designing as a matter of new developments, new solutions, uh, new projects, uh, while working on the existent is always a bit, it's always considered a bit like in the hierarchy, it's much, much lower down. Mm -hmm. uh, but also it has, uh, the situation is really much affecting the way planners are looking at uh, uh, you know, the two opposite uh, cities and countryside or cities and areas which uh, uh, that we call our internal, so inner peripheries of the country where you had the uh, demographic uh, crisis and, uh, and people left. And now there is, of course, a, an interest to understand how much these areas, in fact, benefit of different uh, conditions in comparison to the city, which uh, uh, especially in northern Italy, which are these are the, the most developed areas of the country and they have been the most affected. And the reasons could be various. There is a lot of dealing with the intensive economic activities, and uh, but also pollution or you know, the, the, the density of uh, large uh, urban areas. So there is a big discussion about you know, also territorial uh, uh, balances. And more specifically, I have been involved in a group uh, which is led by the rector and we are working with the city of Milano uh, because one of the core uh, points in the unlock process, so in the process of reopening activities, the main concern is about mobility and how to uh, manage this uh, distancing when you have uh, public transportation which has some limits, it's uh, structural limits. And what is uh, coming out as a, a very interesting uh, perspective to work on is uh, managing uh, schedules and timetables in the city. So understanding how we can plan uh, the timing of uh, the whole schedule of all the activities, given that some are more rigid, like primary schools, uh, and also they are regulated by the state and not by the cities. But many others, like uh, university life, for example, uh, can be managed uh, according to uh, the time where you have more space on public transportation, for example. And, and Politecnico di Milano already resolved that next year we will start all the classes at 10 o'clock in the morning, which is a, you know, where you don't have a peak on public transportation. Uh, and, and we are working uh, in, in different uh, with different disciplines with the city of Milano to support them in defining priorities and in organizing uh, this uh, time planning, I would say. Uh, concerning uh, the university life, I think, and I don't know if this is typically Italian or not, but what we have been suffering a lot is the fact that suddenly, okay, we also, Polytechnico was super, in one week we were all online, and, uh, but immediately what uh, became very clear is that uh, you, you really lose informality. So there is no chance to pass by a colleague or by an administrative staff and to say a word and to solve a problem. But you need to set a meeting, you need to set a, a call, uh, you need to organize it. And this uh, time, day after day became really a burden. You know? And to realize that informality of exchanges very often is really uh, very effective in uh, in solving uh, problems and also in developing ideas. You know? Because by a side, by the fact that you are in a meeting and you see the face of the others, and you have reactions, you, you may be more creative. While uh, with all these video calls, uh, it's all very rational. Uh, it looks very productive, but we suspect uh, it's uh, it is not so much. Uh, and also something which I would like to point out because it's, uh, well, Politecnico di Milano, it's a state, it's a public university. And what I realize, especially as a director, is uh, the duality between uh, academic staff and administrative staff. Because the administrative staff, the contracts are regulated in a very different way. So academics don't have, uh, be, be, beside teaching, uh, we don't have duties. We are not forced to be in the university, while the administrative staff is uh, has a very different contract, and they are supposed to be at the university. 
So this, uh, to me, it was really interesting and important as a head of department uh, to realize that, of course, for many of us as academics, uh, also for students, it can be fine to be in your hometown on the sea or in your second home in the mountains and to work from there it can be very pleasant. And in some way, I'm worried uh, you know, about how to bring back the colleagues to Milano. And while the administrative staff, for many different reasons, doesn't have this freedom. And I think this is a really a, a trade union issue, but also in terms of relations, I had to manage uh, a bit this, uh, this divide. And I think it's really relevant to understand that some and most of us may be very have been very mobile. And also now we are very free to choose how we organize our work while many others, also because of the kind of work they do, they're not free, no? They, they really, either because there are regulations or because I think can be, it can be very boring to do a repetitive bureaucracy work in your kitchen table, on your kitchen table. So after a while, uh, my administrative uh, staff colleagues, they desire to come back to university because for them it's, it's much different if they can do their the bureaucratic work, administrative work with others in a, in a pleasant environment. And I think it's, a, it's a quite an interesting issue. And uh, next year, we, we already, the decision is to have blended teaching. So we will guarantee all students online teaching, but we will be in presence. So this is uh, meant to be uh, to make uh, all our courses available for those who cannot be back in Milano, especially international students, but we will be uh, half of the time in class, so we, which is very complex, but we are organizing to be in presence. Okay, thank you okay. very much, Massimo. Let me now uh, invite Stuart to give his... Uh, his vision on things. So it's 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 not a, a coincidence that we have two Italians because we have to admit from the Austrian viewpoint we learned a lot from Italy. We were super fortunate that it yeah. hit Italy first and it hit it hard. So that <laughs> we were even waking up and we were waking up enormously as you can see, right? So then we decided this is really dramatic and, yeah. and now we are quite good. And the other thing what we have learned is very quickly from the Austrian side we have to look to Eastern, Eastern Asia. And, uh, and therefore, I'm super happy to, to, to have now Stuart, Stuart tell us uh, what they probably also learned before Austria realized that there is something like a, like a virus around. Please. Okay. Thank you for having me, everyone. Thank you for inviting me here. Um, it's late in Tokyo, so I hope I don't uh, say anything really stupid. Um, so, first of all, I was affected by this virus quite early because my former student is an associate professor of public health in China. She's Chinese and she contacted me in January to say that she was completely caught up in it now and she needed help with modeling. She's a modeler and she, we worked together a lot. So we started building a mathematical model of the virus in China when it was still building. Um, and so by the middle of February, I had a very clear idea that this thing was scary. Um, and my my interaction with my Chinese colleagues was showing me that there was a state of complete panic in China. They were really, really scared about what it was doing. Um, and when the city of Wuhan was locked down, um, everyone over there thought it was like the most reasonable decision they'd ever made. Um, and they were really worried. So by the time it started slipping out of China, I was already um, writing papers on it and doing some consultative kind of work, uh, very not very formal, but doing consultative work with my Chinese colleagues. Um, so I kind of saw it coming early and I got a direct insight into what the National Health Commission in Beijing were experiencing. Um, we in Tokyo didn't go into lockdown until the first week of April. And when we went into lockdown, we had, I think, only about 500 or 700 cases a day in Japan and they started going down very quickly. Um, for me, the whole thing, the lockdown and the period leading up to it was actually kind of a boon because in the end of February, I dislocated my kneecap at kickboxing 
and I've needed to get surgery and I couldn't walk very well. Um, and having a massive shift to working from home and particularly not lecturing standing up was a huge benefit to me because I had, I went into surgery on the 15th of April, a week after lockdown. Um, and I, I was on crutches after I came out. So for me, it was a huge bonus. Also, our lockdown was very weak. So I, during the height of the lockdown, I was traveling to the university two days a week to work because I needed to see a doctor and the doctors at my university hospital. So I was commuting in um, and restaurants were open and it was all very, very casual lockdown here in Tokyo. Um, so also I pushed because of my experience with the coronavirus modeling in China and seeing how terrifying it was, I pushed very early for us to go online. So in the faculty meeting where I first dislocated my kneecap, like the, the week that I dislocated it, I was telling everyone, this is a super serious problem. Half of our students are doctors and some of them will be working with coronavirus patients. If we have them in a room, then we are gonna have the worst kind of propaganda for the worst PR for a public health school, right? We're going to be one of the clusters. We're going to be the news. So I pushed for us to go into teleworking from the beginning of March and to make the decision that we would go on to online only teaching a month before the semester started. Our semester starts in April, but I pushed for us to be going online from the beginning of March. And everyone agreed with me. Um, and so we were ready to go online a month before. So some of the speakers here have mentioned that they were told on Friday that on Monday they were going to be teaching online. We decided a month ahead to do that um, from a kind of public health perspective, kind of leading the curve, I guess. And also half of our course has always been online because we target doctors and nurses who can't get study leave. So we already have videos of our lectures and we already had a system in place, an online learning platform and everything. So we simply shifted to the half of our students who are in class becoming part of that online learning process. Um, so I already had videos of my lectures from last year um, and I already had pre-prepared slides with me recording my lectures with Japanese translation and everything. I had it already. So for us, it was kind of a quite easy transition to the new normal. Um, also, we have some overseas students who come on scholarships and they haven't been able to come into the country because of the, the border controls. Um, so we now have to teach online for them. Um, and so now we're shifting already to looking at how we can do mixed online and, and in-class teaching for the next semester so that we can keep those students teaching. Um, so that, I guess, has been uh, not, it hasn't actually been such a big effect on me and my colleagues because we were already preparing for this anyway. Um, a little later, I think I'll talk about the impact it's had on our planning for recruiting more online students and overseas students and changing the balance of those classes. Um, the other big thing for me that I think maybe has not been as prevalent for people in other disciplines is um, I have had frontline experience of watching the global health and public health community completely and utterly fail this challenge. So for example, on the 23rd of uh, February, Wuhan was closed. It was shut down. No one was allowed in or out. Um, so that's a city of 13 million people in a province of 50 million. Um, and within a week, The Lancet had published an editorial talking about how terrible this was. Uh, it was a terrible uh, abuse of, of uh, authoritarian power and advocating for the inclusion of personal freedom in the definition of health that the WHO uses. And then I watched a month later as they published another editorial demanding that Brazil do the same thing. Um, and I have watched so much of the public and global health field completely and utterly fail to rise to this challenge. Um, it's been very educational for me to see how badly they have done. Um, and I think for me, it's had major consequences for the direction my research will take in the next five years, because I think some of my colleagues need a good hard spanking. And I think me and my Chinese colleagues are very interested in administering that spanking if we can. Um, so it's changing my research direction a little as I think about governance issues and, 
and some of the political issues surrounding how global and public health have responded to this very, very bad virus. Um, yeah, so that's that's my position so far. Thank you, Stuart. Uh, I'm writing and writing and I already started with many questions, but we, before, we, uh, before we now go back to after having been to Italy and to Japan, thank you for your uh, for those insights coming back to Vienna. And Heidi, I'd like to ask you now, how have you experienced the last months and what has, has it done to your, to your research activities? Yeah, a short hello to everybody before I start. Um, I don't even dare to say, but I still do. So uh, after being two to three mm, weeks in three, actually, in kind of self-imposed uh, quarantine, I went home to my mom's place. So, since she was uh, eager not to stay alone and get stuck there alone with her dog. So I had kind of a return to, in a sense, to school days for six weeks and had her cook and everything went well. So I'm I'm happy and I was lucky. So I, um, from my personal perspective, the research, um, it did not really change so far. I, I already had been working a lot from at home. So that's what I, I continued there. There was just one research project that um, was about to be finished and there I was uh, lucky because I mean, office work, shifting office work to homework, I, I, I expect it was quite easy at our uh, whole department, but then looking at what uh, uh, what already Christina told us about experimental work. So we have a lot of our data we work on, we gain it uh, with our laboratory experiments or pilot experiments. And there we had uh, this huge restriction, uh, luckily not as huge as it was in Italy. So. Uh, these uh, projects that had been registered for as so-called continuous or long-term experiments, they could be maintained. And two of the people who had access to to our department, they uh, could run the experiments. I could under quotation marks because uh, they still had to find out how and what to do. And that's probably uh, the aspect, the most interesting one that that we intensified and changed our way of communication. So we have three working groups at our department and you can easily just get trapped in either your own working group or your own work at some time. So we really intensified having online meetings in our team. Um, twice It started really twice a week and then it decreased a bit depending on the demand. And so we could instruct those people who went to the lab how to, to run the laboratory systems because it's biological systems and to restart them, the startup will take you a couple of weeks or maybe even, even longer depending on the process. So there we were lucky for, uh, for some of the projects that we could maintain this. And uh, for me personally, there is one pilot plant that uh, got uh, was interrupted because of uh, Corona, but in a way, it uh, also was uh, shut down now. So, so I can I can live with that since the project is over. Yeah, but but the, definitely the experiments are the most challenging thing. Were the most challenging things for us, and uh, what I consider then um, how to say the most um, fruitful thing that that all of us we work very focused on our own stuff on our own projects and then with the colleagues you sometimes need more interaction and it can be to some extent also shallow but it should be deep enough in order to to create some supportive network yeah and this supportive network it's not really fostered at the moment you come as a phd you have to finish within a certain time and you are not really fostered to look a bit to the side, right? And this changed a bit, and I, I hope uh, it will be a sustainable change. And yeah, for online meeting, this is uh, very specific. We have our weekly meetings and we switched to online right away. And this was kind of a rehearsal since, since our institute will get uh, will get separated. So part of us has to to leave the part in the center and go to a few kilometers away campus 
and we were quite worried about communication in general how will that be and yeah based on this uh, kind of general rehearsal it at least can be kept up somehow yeah that's maybe re most important regarding research and teaching um i was lucky uh, as simon mentioned i'm coordinating this uh, new curriculum environmental engineering and i could start with the new semester in the very first two days and then in the second week when we had new teachers we had new lectures and i was in touch with them wednesday should we come should we um, cancel it or not and I, I i just didn't know and then we got actually the news from the media okay universities will be sh shut down and i think that was challenging for the new semesters to some extent even though we, they already had to do distance learning yeah yeah i think i mean I, I was afraid that it would be a bit boring. I mean, my institute, they have a COVID project, so early warning system, uh, checking COVID in uh, wastewater. But apart from that, I'm afraid that the nature of our project, it won't really change, at least as far as I see it now. But uh, I think the way we work, uh, that will change and hopefully in a sustainable way that start, as it started, yeah. So thanks, that's about it. Open for questions. Maybe maybe yes. I should say also the blended learning. I think it's something that will that is discussed at TU Wien as well, and I'm I'm pretty um, uh, excited how that how that will start. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you very much. So uh Obviously, Simon and myself, we couldn't plan exactly how you would answer, and we were a little bit afraid that perhaps your answers would have been uh, too condensed and too short, and this was not at all the case. So basically, you have answered everything what we would have asked you, which is very good, which means that we are perfectly on time after after the first round because you actually answered everything already uh, but this gives us now the possibility to go a little bit in detail uh, perhaps to four or five aspects and then simon said already he had a lot of questions so i will i will ask him then to condense them into two or three and for my side there will be basically i would like to to to, to ask you one question which was very uh, which was a very old question of our visions of our vision group here uh, we were always saying what will happen in five years or in 10 years so to have this mid to long-term perspective and perhaps if we if we do a short round on this um, how do you think of what we experience now what will we see still or how would how would it, would it how will it look like uh, in five years from now say in five years from now and and uh, uh, yeah, perhaps every one of you gives a short uh, uh, account of what he or she thinks uh, what will sustain for, for five years. I will not try to anticipate what will be the answer, but, but what will be still there uh, from what is now new uh, in the midterm future? Perhaps we start again with Christina very quickly. Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't know, really. I hope uh, that... Uh... Uh, a new pandemic uh, will not go <laughs> come back because uh, I think that uh, it, it is uh, difficult to manage this uh, pandemic uh, in, uh, on, under a lot of aspect uh, from uh, working aspect for uh, human aspect so uh, I prefer my hold the life <laughs> without a mask to go in a shop without a mask to go uh, in my office because uh, actually we need we need to to wear the mask also in uh, in in uh, the closed uh, in closed um, environment and closed places so i i I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't I don't like a lot this type of life. Also because, uh, as Heidi said, uh, the communication uh, it is completely changed. Um, I am a user, for example, of Skype and WhatsApp, and uh, I have uh, 
but in this period it was uh, i have a lot of calls uh, every day it, it, i i had uh, one two three four calls uh, and i have to organize uh, all my days all my journey all my, all my days uh, uh, with this type of call, a call from my supervisor, a call of, from uh, my PhD students, um, a, a call for uh, uh, my partner in a project, a call, uh, <laughs> and uh, also a, in the project uh, we have not uh, any uh, human contact, any any meeting, uh, even if uh, only on a website and. Um, it is not, it is strange it is very strange but uh, I, I don't like uh, this so much i prefer the human contact i prefer as I told the massimo also uh, to have uh, a, a talk with my uh, neighbor of office uh, directly and not with uh, whatsapp or with skype or with zoom or teams <laughs> we have a lot of uh, uh, web a lot of platform for uh, having uh, discussion but i prefer the human contact so in the mid term uh, i i hope that uh, first of all uh, uh, and uh, that a new pandemic uh, will not go on and or come back uh, in any case uh, and so uh, i prefer to come back to my whole life uh, with a journal uh, with daily come back in uh, in uh, in office even if uh, I, I, I would like to say that, uh, for example, I personally uh, live outside Turin and uh, I have a garden, for example, I have uh, a good place to, to live and, uh, and, and not uh, in Milan with a very small uh, um, apartment. So my personal uh, lockdown was not so bad because I live in a very small country. But uh, I prefer, in any case, uh, the human contact. I don't know if it is a, a, a characteristic of Italian people, <laughs> I think, but uh, I good. prefer the human yeah. contact. <laughs> Thank you very much. And for your, for your very Socrates-type answer, you don't know, which is beautiful, right? It, it, it means that you, <laughs> that you thought a lot about it. And we also got we got one uh, comment in the chat room, which, was, uh, which, which is uh, related to Massimo's statement about you know cohesion and you know social contact and so on and and uh, okay i think uh, also christina said uh, you know it's a, it's a big loss that is not there so so perhaps let me rephrase this question before i then give back to simon when we have these five years even if it's not the full uh, good old life in five years which of course would be the optimum you, you see how good the old life was uh, what what are, are massimo are there possibilities to or what are your visions to to produce something like a good uh, uh, social coherence and so on, even if we don't, even if we have restricted uh, uh, ways of interacting, right? Is there a blended form of becoming again informal and, and social and because we want to stay informal somehow, you know? So, so what are your visions on this? Can, how is the midterm secure enough a social way of, of, of staying human? Well, a first quick answer on my side was that I discovered that making a normal phone call, it's already much more informal than a Skype, uh, go to meeting or anything else or writing an email. No. Mm -hmm. So just to take the phone without asking, can I call you now, which is by WhatsApp, mm -hmm. just calling the person directly is already quite mm -hmm. uh, more uh, alive and direct. And uh, this is really crazy, but uh, I think it really gives the sense of what we are, we are experiencing. That be, even before calling someone, you send a message to ask if you can disturb, which is absolutely weird. So I think we we have to to resist a bit to the the mainstream way of communicating. On the other hand, I think well we are. Our parks are in Milano uh, have never been so full of people. No? So there is a big desire of people and uh, uh, the parks in Milano were more and more uh, deserted by the Italians and you could mainly see foreign people who would enjoy uh, the public spaces. And I'm quite impressed 
by the fact that people are discovering the pleasure of uh, being in open air and, and staying together. So there are many chances now. I'm in my office in the department and uh, we have been relocating the office. So now there is stuff which is moving things back and, and so we, we can meet. Uh, concerning the future, I have uh, one worry and one one uh, desire, or one expectation. The worry is that I I could see, as I said, and I I, for, I can imagine that there will be a, a big divide be between those who can decide to be mobile or immobile, and can even go for immotility, they just stay still, and those who cannot. And uh, I think uh, you know, already now, yesterday I, I, I was going back home by bike and I could see that at the bus stop, 95% uh, of the people at the bus stop were foreigners, were migrants and not Italians. And I think this divide is, uh, was already there, but now it's really visible. That there are people who can decide to stay at home or to go to work and others who simply have no choice. And uh, I think in a country like Italy and in a city like Milano, where you have uh, quite, uh, it's much more a polarized city than Vienna, many would uh, really stay a lot in their second or third home. And, and I think this affects a lot the city and the way people use the city. So this is a worry and an expectation and, uh, and a hope for, us, for researchers, especially in, in my field of study, is I hope that we will all be less mobile in the sense that we will slow down a bit in our flying around because we know now that we don't need to go to another city for one day meeting. We can solve it in a different way. But I hope that this will lead us also to stay longer abroad. So to say, okay, I come and visit, uh, I work with Simon for three weeks and I can stay in Vienna three weeks. Uh, having long talks and long meetings because I can also manage my things at home from a distance. So I don't need to go back and forth uh, so much. I can, uh, no, I can spend the time abroad and experience a different department uh, while I'm managing my department. And before I didn't have this feeling because uh, no, uh, we were not used at all to this uh, kind of communication, which is of course can be very effective. So I expect uh, that we could, uh, I hope we can be, uh, yes, uh, less uh, flying around <laughs> and more uh, mobile in terms of spending time in different contexts. Thank you, Massimo. Um, there's, um, <clears throat> there's been some, some questions in the, in the chat and uh, yeah. Stuart, I give you the floor to, uh, to respond to some of them. Uh, I'd like to bring in one, one question that, uh, that, that um, highlights another, another aspect of our, of our topic. And it relates to two things that Christina and, um, and Stuart mentioned, which is um, the change of focus in our research um, due to uh, related to COVID-19. But before I forget, uh, this is a brief announcement now uh, organizationally. <laughs> We've just decided amongst the, the moderators that we'll all run by 15 minutes because it's so exciting and we don't want to, uh, uh, to cut that short. Um, sorry, Stuart, for being, being so late. You have, all have to know that Stuart in, in Japan is now way after midnight and Stuart has to struggle hard to keep with us. So I promise Stuart it's not longer than 15 minutes that we all run. But uh, uh, I'd like to pose that next question and that is, Christina, you mentioned all these research grants coming up, and actually, um, it, it also affects our, uh, my my discipline. And a colleague recently asked, "Now we all have to become health experts." There's many calls coming up now, uh, or, or calls for, uh, for for funding, and uh, of course, there's a lot of policy attention by the European Commission and by other funding bodies about uh, about COVID-19. Stuart mentioned in his comment that he sees that he had that his research interests start to slightly change relates related to what he has experienced over, over, over the last months that issues like governance organizational issues etc are coming up uh, Massimo mentioned uh, an interesting one which is uh, that he is now dealing with issues of timing yeah timing of schedules etc and urban planners have 
uh, admittedly neglected the issue of time for uh, for quite some period over the over the last year. So so we see that things things are changing. And the question that I'm that I'm uh, posing to all of you is, uh, but Stuart, you're, I invite you to respond first. <laughs> um, is um, do you think that the that, that, that the, the the research questions that are popping up by funding agencies, you know, the invitations to come forward uh, to uh, to tenders invitations for interdisciplinary collaborations etc are they going in the right way um, and how, it, how 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 should we change in a situation that we all hope that the pandemic is over how can we do our research in the future um, in hopefully a situation that we have survived this uh, this, this pandemic um, what are your thoughts about this Right. Um, first of all, I don't mind staying past 15 minutes more because I, I, I'm just working from home tomorrow, right? Um, so it's no problem. Um, in terms of grant funding and, and these new calls for funds for research, I suspect a lot of it's going to be wasted because a lot of it's going it, to, I think it's a bit cynical to say it, but it's a kind of a gravy train, right? Um, with people just being able to jump into new funding streams the, the money's available and and I think often existing funding streams have dried up because the government's re, you know redirecting money and stuff so I think a lot of it's going to be wasteful um, and not necessarily going to be very productive um, uh, and I think that happened as well in Japan after the Great East Japan earthquake and tsunami a lot of grant money was made available and nothing came out of it um, and I think and a lot of really Shunky projects got funded. I think we'll see the same thing. Um, so I don't think that's necessarily going to benefit us in terms of the fight against coronavirus. Um, I think in future, um, for for our future research projects and our changes in in research direction, um, there is going to obviously, if the virus doesn't go away, there's going to be an obvious need for all of us to pull our weight because this thing's very serious. So people are going to have to redirect their efforts towards new strategies and new goals. Um, uh, as Massimo has observed, urban planning is a super important part of this. And, and um, I don't think anyone has been thinking in general about how to redesign cities to deal with, with quarantines and stuff like that. It's just not on the, on the cards, right? Um, I mean, the last time Britain had a plague, the problem was solved by the city burning down, which is a form of urban planning. Um, so I guess a lot of people are going to have to shift perspective to to take into account this new kind of ongoing pandemic. Um, but I think personally that they're going to find a vaccine and that we're going to be rid of it in a couple of years. Um, it's going to have, I think for education, for teaching, it's going to have huge impacts because for the next two years, no one's going to be able to come from Asia to study in the West. Um, they're not going to be able to study in America or Britain because they're just plague countries. So I think a lot of people are going to be tempted to look east for their education. Um, and Japan and China do have large, they do have large scholarship programs and they can choose to extend them. Um, and I think people are going to start to look at other countries for, as sources of education. Um, so in the future, I think there might be a shift away from the brand name universities of, of the West towards less well-known ones in Asia. Um, so, and I think because we're going to find a vaccine and we're going to get rid of this, um, then probably what's going to happen in five years time is everyone's just going to forget it ever happened and go back to being normal. I mean, universities are very conservative and the way that they function doesn't change rapidly. So the first chance they get to go back to the old standards, they will. But I'm hoping that my university will use this as an opportunity to really grab onto online and mixed education as an opportunity to get some of those students who would previously go to America and Britain and teach them public health in a better way. I mean, America has failed so dismally in this epidemic that the idea of learning public health from them to me is just mysterious. Um, and Britain, which invented a lot of these public health measures, has failed dismally as well. And I'm not sure why we would want to, to learn public health in their institutions. Um, so I'm hoping that we'll be able to grab some of that 
change perspective and and take advantage of it as a way to to teach an Asian perspective on public health. Um, which brings me to one of the questions that's in the chat, if I may take a moment to address them. So a person called Student, who I think invented the t-test, well done Student, asks about um, how the general public can trust the opinion of the scientific community. And, and ISTEM has asked about, um, for me to elaborate on some of my colleagues needing a spanking. Um, and I think it's been really, it's been really disappointing for me to see how Europe and America just ignored everything that was happening in Asia as if it's never going to happen to you guys and then when it reached you started learning the whole process from scratch as if China hadn't been broadcasting from the rooftops that this tragedy was coming um, and I really hope that this is going to lead to a shift in perspective from Europe and America and I guess the, U the UK is no longer part of Europe is it um, and begin to look at the East and take more seriously the lessons that we've learned here and the ideas that we have on public health. Um, and I guess on other aspects of politics and sociology generally, start to open up a little. And I'm hoping that we'll see more diversity in editorial boards and in, in academic processes in the West with more thought about, about what is going on in the rest of the world. I think the Lancet would not have made its mistakes that it made if it had more Chinese people in the editorial board, but they don't and they don't have any connections, so they just missed it. Um, so I think in terms of more trust, I think people need to look back to the systems that have been in place. They need to trust the WHO more. They need to um, put more weight on international organizations and um, look more to the East and be more more open with new ideas from the East instead of, um, instead of just thinking that that you know it just does, doesn't apply to the west anymore um i guess that's and i'm hoping that in the washout from this pa pandemic people will start to think more outside of their european and american bubble to the rest of the world um yeah so i guess that's how i answer those questions thank you Stuart. christina hi massimo what are your thoughts about Christina? You you started the whole thing off with the, all the grants and uh, all these new friends that are asking if you want to share, uh, if, if you want to join project proposals. Uh, so I think that uh, the results from this uh, proposal uh, will be done, will be ready in uh, maybe one year, two years. So. Um, a lot of grant uh, arise uh, in this period for uh, um, improve, for example, the security uh, during a pandemic, uh, or uh, improve uh, uh, also for vaccine uh, vaccine of uh, for the uh, the pandemic for the COVID, uh, or for uh, um, better organize uh, the system uh, in uh, healthcare uh, fields. But uh, I think that uh, all the results uh, of this uh, call uh, will be ready for uh, another pandemic, I hope, uh, not for this one. Uh, in any case, uh, I participate, uh, for example, to four proposals in this period, and uh, uh, they are very short proposals. You have to uh, explain all of your activity in very few uh, pages because obviously uh, people have to read your proposal and uh, um, try to understand if it is a good proposal in a very short period. For example, uh, all of uh, these uh, the results uh, uh, of the proposal will be um, will be done uh, from the commission uh, in few months uh, in any case uh, you have to write a proposal uh, in uh, 10 or 20 days uh, so it is difficult to uh, to prepare a very uh, good proposal uh, for uh, um, in this uh, short period and also the commission has to read the, your proposal in a very short time i don't know if uh, the grant uh, will be a good uh, all these grant because uh, in my for my activity i prepare for example only for grant but uh, there are there were a, a, a 
lot of grants uh, for uh, uh, try to manage the uh, the pandemic, uh, the the COVID pandemic. So um, I don't know if it, uh, it is uh, a good idea to propose uh, all these grants, uh, all these funds, uh, or uh, if. Uh, um, the, 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 um, it is we need a, a better uh, manager of these uh, funds so maybe less funds for uh, uh, for for proposal but uh, more concise uh, for writing a project better for having more time to writing a project it is not so easy to write a project in in few days, in 10 days or in 20 days or in a month in general. Even if this project is uh, contains only a few pages, for example, 10 pages or uh, so very short uh, project. It's not so easy to give your idea and to explain your uh, your idea in, uh, in very few pages. And uh, so I don't know uh, if it it is a good idea to, to it is a good idea to have uh, all of these uh, grant or uh, uh, it is better to have uh, less grant but more uh, uh, more organized so uh, I don't know also because uh, I, I know that for example in my last proposal uh, I have uh, 6 months to have results but if you have, you can continue also your research for other four months, for example. So we will have the, the, the first results in 10 months. Okay, it's good. It's not a, lot, a long period, but I hope that pandemic <laughs> will finish in 10 months and we, uh, we will not need uh, my, the results of my proposal. Yes, if there will be another pandemic, we can use these uh, results, okay, <laughs> but uh, it is, uh, I hope not that these events will not occur uh, anymore. And uh, also, for example, a lot of grants uh, are for a company that uh, would like to change their commercial product and to improve their commercial product. But uh, for example, I know that uh, a lot of uh, disposable masks, for example, were not uh, uh, certificated for uh, the, 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 the COVID, for the virus, the coronavirus. So uh, it is also a waste of money in this sense, because you give some money to a, a company which has a, a, a uh, 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 a good idea probably yes but uh, if this uh, company has a completely different commercial product and uh, would like to prepare uh, other kind of product uh, as uh, for example the disposable mask but uh, this mask has to be certificated this for uh, the, the, the viruses for the bacteria for everything and it's not uh, so easy to have this certification so Okay. I don't know. We are losing Christina a little bit. Yeah, I don't know. Can 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 the others hear me? I hope so. Yeah, somehow. No? Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. Please. So we can you check if your microphone is still on your computer? Yeah. But but I guess we no, okay. Well, I still I think we had a we had a good uh, it became very clear what, what what let's say what Christina was saying coming back to the to the problem of of you know the the administrative organization of of grant schemes and so on uh, perhaps as a as a very last short round I would I would like to bring it back on more the the metaphysical level of of research on the on Stuart told us about the East let's say from a Viennese, uh, uh, let's say in particular also from our university uh, perspective, we can say if you do the statistics of our interactions with peer-reviewed papers, which we, which we co-publish with other universities, we are much more East than, than the more Western part of, of, of the world for some, for some strange reason. So we always have 50-50 uh, between uh, uh, the Asian part and the, and, 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 and the Western part of this world. So there is probably, it's not a coincidence that, that Stuart is also sitting here. Uh, but perhaps a, a very short answer of, of all four of you. Um, 
with the way how we interact scientifically, how we think about science, perhaps how we come back to the very basics of science, finding out how things work. Will we come back clearer to this to these basic questions because of all this mess we are experiencing, and will we be less uh, uh, distracted by by grand schemes, uh, uh, strategic thinking, what the European Union will fund when, and who will think what, and in which editorial board who is sitting when, and and the Lancet is defining what public health is. Are we more aware about it, and and will this last in our lives? I will I will again start with Stuart because he's the the, the one with the longest with the longest day, and then perhaps Heidi. To, to and then Christina and then Massimo, perhaps one sentence or two sentences as an answer. Thanks, Christian. I, I don't have great confidence that anything's going to change. Within my own field, I feel that there is a growing revolt against the Lancet and some of the leading lights of global and public health, but I don't have much confidence that it will change. And um, I think that after this epidemic is over, people are going to go back to normal very quickly and we'll see the same old processes. I really hope that we can stop the conference scam and we can do this online work more and more international interactions. There's no reason why we can't build on what we've experienced in the last three months to make a new form of academia that works better. Um, but I don't have a great deal of confidence that that is going to happen. I think we should all work to make it happen. Um, but I don't have a great deal of confidence that it will. Okay, Heidi. Uh, actually, I'm. I mean, not not uh, thinking of, um, of the nature of the nature of science won't change. I reckon, but I am pretty confident that now, as Massimo said, like going for a one day trip to even somewhere within Austria or to Germany, we can. We saw that it quite where it works quite well also with online meetings and I'm also looking forward to have this kind of hybrid distance learning and uh, and still seeing the students yeah and since um, I'm particularly suffering a bit since uh, our bachelor program was just started like bang with uh, many students many more than we expected and we had to start with um, online teaching uh, right away and so um, I think we should still have the contact with students, which is important, but I also hope that there will be this hybrid system with chat rooms where they feel more familiar uh, talking on, on their own and working on their own. So I, I hope this will be really implemented sustainably in the future. Yeah. Okay, Christina, two sentences, 1.5 sentences. <laughs> Ah, sorry. Okay, we are, we are very sorry. So we we tried to we tried to we tried to uh, I don't know to guess what you said. Uh, we, we are really very sorry. So then I come to Massimo. We are late anyway. I'm I'm very sorry for this, but you know the Christina, you can say something in the chat. You can write if we yes. can. So Massimo, confident, non-confident, medium confident. Uh, um, how will science uh, go on? Yeah. No, I I also agree that I, I see that uh, the COVID-related grants are in the same uh, have the same logic of uh, other mainstream issues which have been driving uh, funding for research. So I'm a bit cynical because of course COVID is, uh, has been affecting a lot of people and it's affecting a lot our. But I I don't see very much difference in the logics and uh, I'm. I think we can be confident if we all together, uh, I mean, we have all responsibilities. No, we are not, uh, so I feel responsible, of course, to provide grants for new colleagues, for young researchers. So I'm not so, uh, I mean, so distant from the issue, but I think we have all responsibilities and we can also influence the system. We are part of it. So I, for example, I discussed a lot uh, with my many colleagues in the department that there are many issues on which we, we have been working until January who are really very relevant for the future and, uh, and also for COVID related issues, even if we never mentioned the pandemia. And I think we should uh, work on long lasting uh, research question, not just on the, on the new mainstream, which is uh, pushing us in some direction. 
And I think we all have a responsibility on it. Even when we judge research grants, when we are asked to be in a committee or we hire a new uh, researcher. So I think we have to be responsible for it. Very good. Thank you very much. Responsibility is a good idea, I guess. Uh, with yeah. this, I give back to my co-moderator, Simon, to say a few uh, finalizing words. And from my side, it was a big pleasure to have you and have your your 1.5 hours time almost uh, uh, in an in a almost informal way of, of, of talking to each other. Uh, we would have never talked in this panel, I guess, without the pandemic. So that's at least something which is positive, I would say. And with this, I give back to, to Simon. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, also from my from my side, thank you all very much for your inputs and for staying staying up so late, Stuart, and uh, sharing your time uh, time with us. It was fantastic, and um, I just like to pick up the term responsibility that uh, that, that Massimo just used, and also link link this to one of the comments we had in the chat about the trust, the public's trust in uh, in, in academia. And actually, uh, even before the pandemic, our little group um, that uh, cares about or that, that dis discusses the future of technical university in Vienna, um, we decided that we wanted uh, that we want to have um, an exchange with as many people as possible who have an interest in this about our responsibilities as uh, as scientists across various uh, various disciplines. And before the pandemic, we said we want to discuss. Our responsibility A um, re related to current issues around climate change or the climate crisis, and B uh, around digitalization, because in both realms, a lot uh, or and, and these are, these are two um, two phenomena or how you how you how you want or two two issues that really demand for our attention um, for a critical re uh, review and two very different ways. We could expand on this now longer, but we won't expand on this much longer today because. Well, we'll have in November. We don't know yet if it's going to be uh, blended or online or uh, or analog. I guess it's going to be a very creative, funky mixture of uh, various forms of collaboration. Maybe even beyond uh, beyond Vienna. So you might want to see one of uh, uh, some so, some people back who'd like to share their ideas with us about how we can. Uh, create a response or uh, sustain a responsible form of science related in the field of climate change and in the field of di digitalization, not only for the specialists, but also for those who are affected by those. That's going to happen in November. I just, uh, you'll see in the chat uh, um, a link to uh, our announcement for this. For today, I'd like to start with, uh, uh, for closing today's session, I'd like to start with thanking Leah, who's been working in the back, and you, you can make yourself visible again if you, if you'd like to, for uh, uh, for the technical uh, background work and logistics that all works well. Apart from uh, hi Leah, thank you very much, um, and I'd like to thank uh, Heidi, Stuart, Christina, and Massimo for for being with us, and for all of you for, uh, for listening to. Uh, um, to our discussion for sharing your thoughts with us and we really look forward to seeing you back at some time in autumn. That was Thanks. it for me. Have a nice evening, okay? Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.